we're all about education at the Functional Forum. And earlier on in the, uh, the second Functional Forum we did on Beyond the Germ Theory, I really shared my, fe my feelings about what it means to be an effective educator. And I think one of the things that we have to realize is that the most important thing in education is not going to be telling people stuff. Because at the moment, there's Wikipedia, there's so many tools online, there's a growing list, there's so many videos and other cool resources. Telling people things is not what's important. What's going to be important in the next generation of education is going to be inspiring people to want to learn. They have to want to learn. If you can inspire someone to want to learn, you've, that's half the battle, more than half the battle. And I can say that the reason why I'm really excited today is because we have someone in the audience to come and speak to you who has played such a big role in my uh, development to being here. So in November 2012, I went to ACAM conference and Dr. Bob Browntree was doing a talk on the human microbiome. And uh, given you had two hours then, you're only going to have 24 minutes tonight, so you had a bit more time to inspire the whole audience. But that moment inspired me to want to learn everything I could about the human microbiome. I think it's the most interesting part of medicine. Jill, we may have you talk a little bit about it later, just to, just to set you up for what's going to happen in the panel. But that day, Bob inspired me to want to learn everything about the microbiome, and in two hours, he, he was the genesis of a learning process that is still going on and was very much at the genesis of the Functional Forum. And so uh, when I was making my wish list of people that I wanted to speak at the Functional Forum, Bob was, uh, Bob was right at the top. Robin, my lawyer. Robin, hey look, there's seats right down at the front. Robin, come sit at the front. This isn't high school. Even the bad kids sit at the front. So getting back to the main point. Dr. Bob Browntree, thank you so much for all the work that you're, you've done throughout your career. It's great to be here in Colorado. And so I'm here to introduce, to give the keynote presentation, Dr. Bob Browntree. Let's have a round of applause. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Dr. Doom. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have heard these statistics, but it bears repeating over and over again that since World War II, since the 40s, we've introduced over 85,000 new synthetic chemicals. 85,000. And every single year, we introduce another 2,000 chemicals that we put in our creams and our face creams and our soap and our shampoo. We, we put them in our food. We spray them on our lawns. We put them in our flea collars for our pets. They're everywhere. And about 3,000 of these chemicals are manufactured in huge production volumes. More than a million pounds of each one of these chemicals produced in the U.S. every year. And that's really where the big concern is. Is some of these chemicals now that use some form of glyphosate. When you hear the arguments about GMOs, well, are they safe, aren't they safe? The arguments almost never talk about glyphosate. But that's the real elephant in the living room, is glyphosate. Why? Because you know what? It's in us. We all have glyphosate in our bodies. This was a study that was published in 2012. It was done in Berlin, Germany, which is a real agricultural place, I can tell you. And the people that they examined were Journalists, lawyers, city workers, people that never went to farms. Guess what? 100% of them had glyphosate, had Roundup in their urine. 100%. Another study was published last year that was done in something like 14 different European countries. What do you think they found? Glyphosate all over Europe. Actually, one of the lowest countries was Switzerland. And I think under that was Bulgaria. So we are all peeing out glyphosate. Now, you know what Monsanto says? That's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine because glyphosate is not metabolized. It goes through our body uh, unaffected. We simply pee it out, and that's great. Do you think it's great? I don't think it's great. It concerns me that this is in my body. Where is it coming from? It's coming from food. 
This is the study that was published by Friends of the Earth Europe last year where they looked at European countries. The worst was Malta, followed by Germany and Great Britain. Poland, 70% of people had glyphosate. Interestingly enough, the Macedonians seem to be off the hook. Why is that? I don't know. This is a quote from one of my all-time heroes, Dr. Philip Landrigan. Dr. Landrigan says, what typically will happen is that smart chemists will develop a new product, see that it's useful, and then put it in you, you consumer goods, and it becomes ubiquitous. It gets disseminated all throughout the marketplace, and then 15 years later, we find out, oh, gee, this is a problem. And guess what? We never tested it in the first place. It was never tested. Let me give you an example. Anybody heard of this chemical? Bisphenol A. Bisphenol A was synthesized in 1891, a long time ago. And then years later, it was taken off the shelf and looked at as a synthetic estrogen. It was a drug candidate. And the only reason it didn't come into widespread use as a prescription drug was because they discovered another drug that had very similar effects, but was a little bit more potent, and that drug was diethylstilbestrol. And we all know the story of what happened with that. It was a total environmental disaster. And diethylstilbestrol was really the first chemical that was discovered to have endocrine-disrupting properties. It messed with the fundamental signaling of life. It messed with the endocrine system. And that's what bisphenol A does. That was known from the very beginning. So when DES came into favor, the bisphenol A got put on the shelf until somebody discovered that you can polymerize it. You make a polymer out of it, and it makes this nice hard plastic that supposedly doesn't break down. That's cool, isn't it? Let's put it into water bottles. Let's put it into baby bottles made out of something called polycarbonate, which supposedly doesn't leach. And it wasn't until this stuff got widely distributed in the environment, it got put in epoxy resins. It's, it's in dental fillings. And it lines 80% of the canned food in the United States. Even canned foods that are made by companies that sell organic products are lined with bisphenol A. It's also on cash register receipts. Almost all cash register receipts that have that shiny, slippery kind of feeling, it's the bisphenol A coating on it that gives it that feeling. And it's been shown that when you handle those receipts, you absorb it through the skin. Which explains why 90% of people in the U.S. have bisphenol A in their bodies. Is this a concern? Yes, it's an endocrine disruptor. And it's especially concerning for kids because they're going through all these changes with puberty, right? They're in a window of vulnerability in their life. And here they are eating foods out of cans or polycarbonate bottles or baby bottles that are a source of bisphenol A that has been shown in numerous published studies to be linked to heart disease, diabetes, liver inflammation, obesity, thyroid disorders, cancer, infertility, I had a patient come in yesterday who had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And, you know, this is a very common thing in this country. We have an epidemic of thyroid disorders. And I just looked at her and I said, why are you here? You know, you've already seen an endocrinologist. You're already taking Synthroid. What's the big deal? I was just trying to challenge her a little bit. And she basically said, I want to know why this happened. And no one has offered that explanation to me. And, of course, that launched a long discussion about perchlorate and, and other endocrine disruptors that we know in the environment can interfere with thyroid function. Why is no one asking this question? Why is no one tracking this? I think because the tendency is to think people like this are, they're a little bit strange. You know, these chemically sensitive people, they can't even go into a grocery store without having to put on a mask. Well, maybe this woman is smart. Maybe she knows what's going on. You know when you go into the hardware store and there's that funny kind of pesticide-y smell? Do you think that's good to be smelling that on a regular basis? Well, every time you smell something like that, that basically means it's coming into your body. Just because it's going into your olfactory nerve 
doesn't mean it ends there. It's going into your body and it's contributing to the total toxic load. The total toxic load is the burden of all the toxins that are in our environment and the toxins that we create in our gut on a regular basis. So this is a very, very valuable concept. Every patient I see, I, I evaluate them in terms of where I think their total toxic load is. A bigger term that's emerged in the literature is the exposome. The exposome is everything we're exposed to. Radiation, stress, lifestyle, cigarette smoking, infections, drugs, diet, pollution. All of these things add up. Not only do they contribute to the toxins coming into our body, but they also affect how we process these toxins. I just read an amazing study recently that was saying that it turns out vitamin D has a profound influence on the enzymes that break down toxins in our body. For those of you who want the detail, it's CYP3A4. Vitamin D induces that enzyme. And so when people have more vitamin D in their system, the enzyme is activated. And that actually can change blood levels of drugs and toxins. So it gives you an idea of how things in your environment can have a very profound uh, influence. This was a study that was done at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where Dr. Philip Landrigan practices, and it was uh, entitled Body Burden, the Pollution of People. I believe it's on the Environmental Working Group website if you want to download that. And what did they do? They looked at uh, nine different people, nine volunteers, and they found 167 different chemical pollutants, an average of 53 carcinogens in each person. So we all have this. We're all carrying this total body burden, this total toxic load. Well, so what's the big deal? Um, I first showed this at a seminar by Robert, that Robert Crayon, many of you remember Robert, um, our beloved nutritionist. And years later, he would come up to me and say, Bob, I can't get that freaky frog out of my mind. You know, because what does this say? This is endocrine disruption. This is what happens when you disrupt the signaling of life as you start creating strange creatures. What has happened to the frogs? I grew up in South Alabama, and the, it used to be covered with frogs every spring. Sometimes you couldn't avoid stepping on them. Well, this is what Rachel Carson was talking about. The spring is becoming silent because the number of animals is dropping. What are disorders that are linked to total body burden? What happens when you disrupt these endocrine signals? Well, the obvious things are chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chemical sensitivity, but what about allergies? Allergies have been linked to phthalates in the environment. Asthma linked to phthalates. Atherosclerosis linked to heavy metals. Cancer, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease. Psychiatric disorders. What are mood disorders? Is it a deficiency of a neurotransmitter, which is what the drug companies would have us believe? Or is it a problem with the mitochondria that generate the energy to make the neurons work better. If you damage the mitochondria in your neurons, then what happens? Of course you're not going to make enough neurotransmitters. So here's a way, as I said, this talk is mostly about how do you, how do you frame this discussion so that when you're talking to people who are saying, well, if we're just swimming in all these toxins, how come we're not all dead? Well, we will be, right? But certain people are going to get there sooner than the rest of us. And how do you determine that disease risk? Here is a simple formula that's straight out of the medical literature. This is from a journal, Environmental Health Perspectives, that says there's three different things you can look at. There's toxic potency. Okay? Most conventional toxicology looks at the potency issue. Well, there's a quote from, that I think is very powerful that says, you know, what are you more concerned about? How much lead it takes to kill a child? Or how much lead does it take to cause mental dysfunction? Or anemia? So the, the conventional perspective in toxicology is to say, we want to know how much it takes to kill a person. And if it doesn't kill a person, who cares about the effects of low-dose exposure? Well, if you think about low-dose exposure as something that happens every day of our lives, then you can have a lower toxic potency, but that can build up over time to increase the total body burden. And in susceptible individuals, let's say somebody with a vitamin D deficiency, 
or somebody with an intestinal microbiome that's off. They don't have the right kind of bacteria in their gut, so they can't process these toxins very effectively. That person is going to be more susceptible. So you see how you can change these different variables so that one person can be highly susceptible even if their body burden isn't that great and the toxic potency isn't that great. That person that maybe we call a chemically sensitive individual can get really sick from just a little bit of a chemical. But the traditional perspective of toxicology is we only care about this. We don't care about the rest of it. And that is changing. I want to tell you, this is changing. This is in the research. It's changing. So typically this is how the government sets a standard. It says, well, here's the increasing exposure to a toxicant, and here's the, the level that it takes to do harm. So let's take this point here and say the average person is going to get harmed here. Let's cut that in half. And we'll say everything below that, don't worry about it. But susceptible individuals are the ones that are going to get harmed. And there is a subcategory of the population that is susceptible by definition, and that's our children. And part of the reason I'm so invested in doing this toxic research is because I don't want the next generation to come to us and say, why didn't you do something? Because we're the ones that have to deal with it. So what is the total toxic burden? What determines that? Well, it's our exposure minus our ability to detoxify and excrete. So that little video you saw in the beginning said in versus out. Well, there's just a little bit more to it than that. You know, it's what's coming in and then something has to happen to it. And then you excrete it. Very basic concept. Uh, three hour biochemistry pharmacology lecture down to one slide, which is that if the toxins are water soluble, you can pee them out if you drink enough water. And I've seen in the conventional medical literature stuff that downplays the value of detoxification because it says, gee, just drink more water. Drink more water and you'll flush out all the toxins. Well, that completely ignores the research that says the toxins we're most concerned about are the ones that are fat-soluble because the fat-soluble ones go into our body fat and hang out in our body fat. How do they get out of the body fat? Well, little bits of them will leach out into the bloodstream, go through the liver, and the liver has enzymes that will biotransform those toxins. And that's where it gets really exciting because we know that we can influence that process of biotransformation. An amazing study just came out that was done in China where there are a lot of exposure to environmental toxins. Believe me, I was there last year and you, know, you can't see across the street because of the smog. Um, I, if any of you have seen the movie Her, um, the, it's filmed in Shanghai and he keeps walking through all these tall buildings and you, you see the smog in the background all the time. And I thought, well, that's smog light compared to Beijing, right? It's a, it's a really great place to study environmental toxicity because everybody has a high total toxic load. This study basically gave people ground up broccoli sprouts. Ground up. They made a drink out of these broccoli sprouts and it doesn't taste good. I can tell you that. So they mixed it with lime juice. And they had them drink this for several months, and then they measured the toxins they were excreting, and you know what happened? The level of the toxins in their urine went way up, and it stayed up. That's the important thing. It stayed up. It didn't just go up overnight. It stayed up for months. So the idea that you can support, that you can activate this detoxification, this biotransformation process, and you can keep it going over a long period of time and thereby lower the person's total toxic load is a completely valid scientific concept. So this is what I'm saying. Certain foods have been shown to activate the enzymes in our liver and in other tissues in our body that can transform fat-soluble toxins and move them out of the system. And the most potent group of vegetables that have been shown to do this are brassica vegetables. Now that is a very truncated list, right? There's a lot of other foods. Green tea will do it. Turmeric will do it. And Dr. Minnick is an expert on this and will tell you lots and lots about this. But I just wanted to give you the idea that there's research behind this. This is not some fringe thing. This is current state-of-the-art research. That research that I'm talking about came out of Johns Hopkins. 
And I hope we're going to see a lot more of it. So here are the principles of how to detoxify according to functional medicine. Number one, obviously, is you want to minimize exposure. Don't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't eat. It's that simple. Think about what you put on your lawn. I am not totally against the use of all pesticides and weed killers and things like that, but I am extremely judicious, you know? I, well, I won't use Roundup. In fact, I'm having a little raffle after this lecture, and uh, I'm going to give away my unopened canister of Roundup that I have at home that I bought and have never been able to bring myself to open. So, I'm, you know, I'm not totally back to the land, all natural, etc. I, I can see how there might be a value to occasionally using these things, but the more you think about it, the less you want to use them. So number one, minimize exposure. Number two, have better poops. It's the best way I can put it, is that, you know, high, high quality uh, bowel movements are one of the best things you can do to get these toxins out of your system, which means lots of fiber, good hydration. I don't argue with that recommendation to keep the hydration up, but it's got to be quality water. You've got to think about where it's coming from. Has it been purified? Some parts of this country, you don't want to be drinking tap water without a filter. Sweating is good. I was in a dance class this morning and, and it was hot and a lot of people were sweating and I said, you know, you should charge extra. You should call this a detoxification class for 20 extra bucks. We're all detoxifying away. Enhancing antioxidant reserves. You might have heard a lot of stuff in the, in the research literature about how antioxidants are really not that good for you, et cetera. Well, no one's arguing that plant-based antioxidants, which is blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, green tea, curcumin from turmeric, no one is arguing that that stuff is, they're not saying that's unhealthy. You know, there is some debate. Is it, does it really help to just take vitamin C by itself? Well, it's not enough. It's got to be plant-based. So that's what I mean by antioxidant reserves. And then finally, supporting biotransformation of toxicants. And what I mean by that is simply activating those enzymes in the liver with things like brassica vegetables, broccoli, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, watercress, all of those foods are particularly good for moving things through your system. We have some very elaborate food plans, which I think you're going to hear about in more detail later on. I just want to mention we have an elimination diet. Um, we have the plant spectrum diet. We have a detox food plan. And then we personalize all this stuff for the individual. So it's not just, hey, just eat better. I think Michael Pollan, he's got the right idea, you know. Uh, don't eat too much and mostly eat plants. You can't really improve on that, but we can get very specific, and that's what the Institute of Functional Medicine has done in, in some detail. That's what it looks like. Doesn't that just make you feel good? See, I have to show these pictures at the end <laughs> so that you don't come away with the Dr. Doom, we're all going to die. So a gentle daily detox program that I recommend to most of my patients, healthy bacteria, probiotics, fiber, oats, flax, chia seeds, I love, chlorella, green algae, a number of studies showing the benefits of chlorella, brassica vegetables I mentioned, green tea, spices, garlic, rosemary, curry, pomegranate juice, red wine or a little purple grape juice, organic chocolate, makes you smile, yes, milk thistle, vitamin D, N-acetylcysteine, and alpha lipoic acid. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleagues, and they're going to tell you what all, those, all this means. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>